Good morning, guys. Welcome to the podcast today. I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Logan Weaver. He's the founder of and CEO of Surmount AI. He's um, based out of the uh, East Coast as well as uh, Silicon Valley. And it's really interesting how he built Surmount AI. We're going to learn all about what it is. It's an automated trading platform, and I'm really happy to welcome him to the show. Logan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Briefly introduce yourself and we'll dive right into the questions. Yeah, absolutely. It's basically, like you said, founder and CEO at Surmount. Initially, I write a joke all the time that we built a fintech company in the middle of a cornfield. Well, I grew up in a very small town in Maryland, like rising sun in Tiso County. So if you drive 10 minutes, um, I guess, to from where my dad's house is, where I grew up. You're in Amish country, Pennsylvania, like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Oftentimes more horse and buggies and cars. So really didn't come from a tech background, more so came from a finance and mathematics background. My grandfather was a CFA, CPA, and basically how the whole story got started. So I was in sixth grade. I was going to a, a K through 12 mathematics or a private school that me and my grandmother put us into. And I think I would spend weekends with them because my parents were always working, they were always in the picture, but I would spend weekends with my grandfather and he had a small, like a, uh, on the side, like a hardware shop where he would rent tools, like chainsaws, small equipment out. And I think I was just annoying him one weekend because I think the hens just wrapped him. So he was like, all right, let's sit down and focus on this. And what it was, I was always, he was always into the stock market and they do have some, that's what he was doing in his free time. And he introduced me to paper trading on Investopedia and basically um, trying to teach me about the markets in that way. And basically just the simulation accounts for no real money rather is on the line and did that for years. And then basically my goal from that point to probably like eighth grade, maybe ninth grade summer was, okay, I want to save up as much as I possibly can. I want to create my own investment account and be off the races. So I saved up from, lo from working at a couple local restaurants and actually helping him at his construction company. And my goal was $5,000. I got a little bit over $40, dollars and made an Ally Invest account and was confident I'd been doing these paper trading competition. And then I got a huge slap in the face at a realization of, oh, it's my own money on the line now. I was dealing with the emotional aspect for the first time, which was hesitating on a lot of things that I was either could have been right and was wrong on, or basically just played things incorrectly just because I didn't have that emotional kind of skill set built up yet. And luckily I stumbled across the Kevin Day book, which he writes about like algorithmic trading strategies. And just going back to, I was always a huge math nerd. Still, isn't this, I saw it by the end of like chapter one and two as a way to focus on the markets more strategically and through a statistical standpoint, as opposed to an emotional standpoint. She started building algorithmic trading strategies when I was at UMD and Robert H. Smith School of Business, started what ultimately became Timo. And it really began as like a friends and family project and then scaled into what it is today of about 10,000 plus monthly active users, a little bit under 40 million in AUM and about 90 million in assets earned and trading. Sorry, that was super long winded, but it's the whole story. Yeah. yeah. What Interesting. What does, what does surmount AI do? What is the, what is its uh, USP or what is its competitive advantage? Yeah, absolutely. We started as basically a data, we were just trying to capture cream and generate predictive analytics around any data point that we could find that could be applied to financial markets. So this is macro, microeconomics, descriptive, fundamental, alternative, like anything that you could think of that can be applied to market. And then. We started throwing that to other student management investment funds because we started in at, at UMD. And then from there, started selling to a couple of REAs and we kept hearing from people, hey, this is really interesting. This data is pretty valuable, but it would be a lot easier if you could make an execution layer where it made it pretty simple and easy to build out the models on top of this data. So, okay, no problem. Let's do that. Build a data layer, build an execution layer. And then ultimately what it is today, it's evolved into where now you can easily interface with it. And it's basically a web application, soon to be mobile as well, where you can basically go on, you can generate AI generated super bespoke portfolios for you and, or use something that's pre-built made by like an investment professional. So this could be a creator in a space. It could be an RIA, an SMA or hedge funds, basically just making the whole process of automating any investment account using data-driven investment strategies, painless. 
Mm, yeah, really interesting. And one, I have, you know, I have questions about the, the company and all of that in what you, it sounds like you're using data in AI and discuss yeah. how AI is changing the landscape of trading and what advantages does automated trading provide and how does surmount ensure accuracy and reliability in its predictions? Yeah, no, that's a, good, a really great question. So I think I had this conversation all the time. I think AI, like generative AI, it's a good way to interface with the model and allow non-textual, non-financial savvy individuals to share insights, maybe expedite some due diligence. I think really what's still being flipped on is the ML aspects, especially when you're dealing with so many numbers and so many variables, really large language models are the way to go for obvious reasons. I do think that companies that are out here using ML and applying it directly to large uh, numerical data sets, time series, historical d uh, data, like there's a lot of location there. The problem is overfitting. And that's one of the things that we ran into in like 2021, when we just started building our own that portion of, at that point of product now business. And everything that we would create was just massively overfitted and you would transition into the live environment or forward testing environment. And it was just not going well. So what we did was we basically have something that essentially replicates the process of natural evolution in the background. That's for creating strategies. Then we filter them into the forward testing environment to determine are they overfitted or are they not? And then that helps us determine a probability for any parameters. Basically what we want to do is determine the probability of comparability or like specific parameters, parameter combinations. And I think that's been really interesting for us and part of our secret sauce is just instead of focusing on, okay, let's build the, the top winning of strategies. Okay. Let's actually take a step back. Let's look at what goes into those winning strategies and really at the end of the day, what data that you use and how you consider using that data. We really focus in on that as opposed to the high level, let's just build the best investment strategies in the world. And that's why you see a handful of them. I think right now we have 56 lives that the company's created that are running real money anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to a few million dollars. And I think that's been helpful as well as just that we're, I, I don't think we're at a point yet to where you can just let, in most cases, many cases, where you can just let AI ML just run free and have free reign. And sometimes we'll do some weird things. It'll maybe the market adjusts and it's still just in its ways for one specific way to approach the market. I think having the sheeting route and just making sure it's nothing else you're overseeing the model is still very important. So I'm excited to get to the point where AI and nothing just handle 100% of it. And you can just trust that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. I think we're still probably two to five years away from that. Yeah. Interesting. We have been, cause I'm, I'm this whole AI in the, just kind of the applications, we're just touching the tip of the surface and the stock in Nutella was saying, this is a general purpose infrastructure innovation, which is very akin to the internet, explore the vision behind making sophisticated investment tools accessible to everyone. And how does surmount AI democratize investment opportunities for both seasoned investors and beginners? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a pretty good question. So we have always been really focused on the big picture being, let's make it easy for millions of investors, tens of billions of dollars in AUM to break away from the traditional methods. So. My thesis is that there's three ways that people are mostly approaching the market right now. One is just working with the traditional financial advisor, where you're typically one client of a dozen to many on the size of the firm. But I think they're great at building and maintaining relationships. If you ask your financial advisor, if you call 20 people out of a crowd that are working with a financial advisor and say, how much are you paying them and how is it performing against the market and against other advisors? Oftentimes it's harder for people to answer those two questions than you might think. So I think there's just a little bit of a lack of transparency. I think sometimes the incentives aren't fully aligned. My grandma, for example, had somebody at, at Merrill Lynch, I was <laughs> considering that name dropped in the firm, but they just, they took horrible care of her. And so they, we did a, a quarterly review with them and we were asking them, like, why were you pushing, I forget what it was exactly. It was a few, probably three or four years ago, but they're just pushing decisions that didn't align with an 80 year old you know, woman who's retired and just wants stability and a source of liberal link. And they couldn't answer the question really. 
And w- what we came to find out was they were just maximizing commissions on a couple of things that before end of year. And sometimes you have to really wash them. And it's great if you have somebody that you have a 10 year, 20 year relationship with, but I think that's option one. It's, I think option two is like going to the robo advisors where you fill out suitability, KYC, and you get like a cookie cutter portfolio. So there's something that's made by Vanguard. You and I can fill it out a little bit differently and we might end up in the same exact allocation. Again, there's really just not that level of customization and personalization there. And then three is where you just on a no commission broker making 100% of the, de- of the decisions yourself. And that tends to not fare well for most people, even if they're more advanced, just because it's a full-time job. And if you aren't, if you're overacting, sometimes maybe underactive, although I would say overacting is worse. And there's just so many things that can go wrong. And if you're not treating it as if it's a full-time job, it's just on the side, you're probably going to underperform the S&P. Um, so I think those are the three options. No commission brokers, robo-advisors, and traditional advisors. And what we saw was that there's some a need for something in the middle, right? People want to be hands-on. They want to actually see what's going on, but they don't necessarily want to make all of the decisions themselves. So this is a way essentially for them to make the decision on, okay, the strategy or this set of strategies is a good fit for my objectives. Maybe if they want to, they can fill out a questionnaire that can create something off the cuff that it's very likely nobody else is using that exact allocation. So it's truly made for them. And the goal is just to shift investment investment management to a software-driven, highly disposable, highly customer model that benefits the client more than it does the institution or advisor or whoever you're working with. There's a, a couple more questions. And what are your insights on current trends in financial markets? And what do you see the future of fintech and where you see automated trading headed in the next five to 10 years? What what are you doing to stay ahead of the curve? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, I think the future of fintech, again, is just that my thesis is just hyper-personalized. I think with this software-driven, pretty advanced technology, it opens an opportunity to, for consumers to have a low-cost, high-personalized, high-personalized, highly, in some cases, or probably like more effective and approach than just allocating all of your money into the S&P or the broader, whatever broader index you try to track. I think this is a way to never time the market, but maybe position yourself to take profit at more ideal timeframes. It's a way to, again, like it, it can adapt to you as your financial situation change, change it as your goals change. So it's a way to, I really think at the end of the day, to provide more value for the consumer. I think outside of investment management. I think largely the same is true. Like you see a couple of neo banks applying AI in, in interesting ways right now. Do you see payment processors that are trying to figure out how to apply AI and all to benefit the, the end consumer? I think a lot of people are still figuring it out across the industry. Um, but I'm fighting in terms of the technology is there, the innovate opportunity and hunger is there. And I think all the good companies that I see are really consumer centric and thinking not necessarily, okay, how do I benefit the large investment bank. It's how do I benefit the end consumer? Because I think at the end of the day, more and more people are going to be interfacing directly with these, with these different types of software. And I think that's pretty powerful. And, and the companies that can really nail down on that, you know, direct consumer approach in a way that's truly valuable for the end client, I think they'll do quite well. Oh, interesting. Moving on the scale, scaling a fintech company. How are you, how are you raising capital? Is it through seed or is it angel? Talk about growing and scaling your company. Yeah, absolutely. So we bootstrapped up until Techstars and even at some point, a little bit after Techstars, um, we graduated Techstars then raised about $750,000 from, uh, mostly angels. So I found our GoFundMe. Uh, one of the founder members of Renex Rocks Technologies, which whatever I create that we, if you're ever signed by the IDs, they've helped to invent the state. Brought on a couple of really great angels and basically looked at our pre-seed round is, how do we structure a strategic advisory board where people have skin in the game? So the things that we wanted to solve for at that point that we felt a little bit weaker were how do we scale this architecture in an efficient and reliable way? How do we make sure that at any given moment we're remaining compliant and on top of that world? Because I think there's two ways that we've always said that you can kill a company quickly in this space. That's one, you lose people for money in a data breach or something of that nature, a way that isn't necessarily one-to-one with the market. 
And two, it's obviously break out of compliance and do something poorly. So we really wanted to make sure that we were on top of those things. And then we did raise another round, largely from the same investors. Up to this point, we've only raised 1.4, which only $1.4 million is a lot of money, but comparatively speaking, it's about 10x to, in some smaller cases, 5x less than our competitors. And then we're actually talking right now, we opened a seed round a couple of weeks ago for 3 million. We got 2.3 million committed in under two weeks, So we pushed it to five because we wanted to severe first price round. And then we're talking right now with, with raising potentially 10 and just skipping seed and growth right to QSA. So I think that's just a testament of people that we've brought on and surrounded ourselves with just quickly you've grown. It's, we've grown by about 7600 percent in the past 12 months. So I think we're really just trying to uh, keep our foot on the gas there and, and really drive this to our, our first 1 billion AUM. Yeah. And then how did you manage rapid expansion while maintaining quality and innovation? We always hear about these startups, like they grow very quickly and it's all the volume. And talk about kind of the biggest challenges, biggest breakthroughs building and scaling and how you overcame them. Absolutely. In my experience, I think largely one of the most potentially negatively impactful things that you can do with a startup is hire too fast. So we always maintained a really lean team or still seven right now. So we have just a great group of people. They've always looked at things in terms of let's bring on the highest caliber of person that we can convince to come work at this early stage startup, as opposed to maybe getting more people for cheaper, but then just to manage more. And I think it builds maybe a culture of not inefficiency, but maybe lack of maximum efficiency. So we just have a group of seven killers. And I think that's been really great in terms of allowing us to maintain a high rate of speed without sacrificing too much internally. I think largely one of the biggest problems that we faced with scaling is just making sure that the architecture that we're always one or two steps ahead of our scalability in terms of what our architecture it's built for. But again, just bringing our own great people around us, both in and outside of the team, uh, that's allowed us to, I would say right now we're five steps ahead. You know, we were ready for uh, basically the first probably 500 million to, you know, 750 million in, in AUM and just thinking about what that means in terms of your volume standpoint. And largely we work with a lot of like external brokers as well. So I think largely it's. They can be, uh, they're not real partners, but I think sometimes the bottleneck is not necessarily eat company. It's how many orders we're routing in a small amount of time to those companies. We solve for that though. I, I think just having a simple order queue has largely improved all of that. And then just trying to do batch orders that way we're not overloading their APIs. Whereas then we the step we third of order had been uh, a small amount of time. Yeah. How can people find out more about surround and reach out to you and learn about the work that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think all of our socials are just at Sumo or invest, whatever you're on, whether it's YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, I think always still free to head into company. It's just www.surmo.ai. And then I'm always available on LinkedIn or in flash Logan dash Weaver. Yeah. Awesome. And thanks so much for coming on in a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris.